Uh, my name is Jan Sveinar. I'm a professor here. I also direct the Center on Global Economic Governance, which is one of the institutions sponsoring uh, uh, tonight's event. And I'm uh, happy to welcome you all here at Columbia University. Let me uh, thank uh, not only the esteemed speakers who are here, as you can see, but also the other co-organizers, which is the Program on Economic uh, Research, PER, which is at the Economics Department here at Columbia and Columbia University Press uh, that has a table outside there that you could see uh, the books that came out of the series of lectures uh, devoted to Kenneth Arrow and the whole program. Uh, the members committee, uh, fellow members on the committee that uh, runs this program are Patrick Bolton, uh, Jon Kul Che, Joe Stiglitz, Michael Woodford, and per executive director Michael Weinstein. So I'd like to thank them for uh, being here. And of course, uh, Bridget Flannery McCoy and Miles Thompson of Columbia University Press. Please uh, take your seats as you're, as you're coming in. So we're very honored tonight to have uh, Alvin Roth here. You know, he's the 2012 Nobel laureate in economic sciences. He's the Crack and Susan McCaw Professor of Economics at Stanford University and he will present the 11th annual uh, Kenneth J. Arrow lecture on market design in large worlds, the example of kidney exchange. Uh, the discussants will be Joseph Stiglitz, also a Nobel Prize laureate from a few years earlier, 2001, and Parak Patak, who is the Jane Berkowitz and Carlton and Dennis William Carlton Professor of Microeconomics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, David Weinstein, uh, who is the Carl S. Schub Professor of Japanese Economy and Director of the Research at the Center of Japanese Economy and Business at Columbia University, will serve as the moderator. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, the um, Kenneth J. Arrow Lecture Series was established at Columbia in 2008 to honor the career and impact of one of Columbia's most uh, illustrious and renowned graduates, uh, Kenneth Arrow himself, uh, uh, Nobel Prize laureate, and his ideas, style of research uh, have uh, motivated and really inspired uh, entire several generations of economists. His work uh, spanned many, many areas ranging from general equilibrium, social choice, endogenous growth, and uh, the series is uh, devoted to uh, commemorate and recognize and honor uh, Professor Arrow. Um, the spirit uh, of uh, Ken Arrow's work is also embodied in uh, the work of Alvin Roth, uh, who has made very significant uh, contributions in many areas of economics, including uh, pathbreaking research in game theory, in market design, and experimental economics. Uh, Al received the Nobel Prize in economics in 2012. And uh, he uh, is the uh, Alfred P. Sloan Fellow. He is, was a Guggenheim Fellow, Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, member of the National Bureau of Economic Research, Econometric Society, National Academy of Sciences, served as the president of the American Economic Association in 2017. And in addition to all these things, he's the one who recruited me when we were young economists at the University of Pittsburgh a very memorable event because the recruitment meant every lunch I had to go swim with Al Roth. And uh, he had a theory which was basically saying, we should go swimming because actually in the long run we'll be more productive than if we spend the lunch working on papers. So Al, thank you very much and uh, the floor is yours. So this, this is the, it's going to be the, the fourth Arrow lecture that I've given. And it's the first one in which Ken was not sitting in the front row. So, uh, so I miss Ken. We gave a, a memorial uh, event for him this time last year. Uh, and I guess future hour lectures are all going to be memorial events. Uh, so I'm very glad to be here and, and speak in his honor. I'm also glad to be here at Columbia because I was an undergraduate here. And I, I realized that when I composed this slide that, that I was creating a kind of optical illusion. Something about the composition of the slide makes it seem as if that was a long time ago. <laughs> so speaking of a long time ago, the way I'm going to organize my lecture is with a kind of essay I'm, I'm on and off trying to write with, with Bob Wilson, my colleague at Stanford, who was my advisor years ago. Uh, 
And, and we were asked to, to think about how market design evolved from game theory as we were learning those things. And so that's the framework that I'm going to, to try to take. And so to do that, let me give you a, a very quick history of game theory. Game theory in one slide. And uh, a lot of our framework for thinking about game theory comes from the book of uh, Norman and Morgenstern, written in the 1940s. Um, there were earlier predecessors, but, but a lot of what we do comes from, from the way they thought about games. And in particular, they thought that there might be two kinds of game theory for two different kinds of games. And on the one hand, there'd be cooperative games, games where we had available to us binding agreements that we could make. And the object of such games would be to decide, the object of studying such games would be to analyze what kinds of agreements rational individuals would make if they had available a technology that allowed them to make binding agreements. And on the other hand, there would be non-cooperative games, games where we didn't have a technology to make binding agreements, where the object would be to figure out what we would do on the understanding that we couldn't make agreements with each other, but that, but that everyone in the game was, was rational. And these two kinds of game theory for what were thought to be two different kinds of games uh, used different kinds of models. So the non-cooperative game theory used strategic models, models of what you could do, and the, the solution that, that we now look for, this wasn't in von Neumann and Morgenstern, were, were refinements of Nash equilibrium, when one way to interpret Nash equilibrium were as self-enforcing agreements, agreements that once we expected everyone to carry them out, everyone had a, an incentive to carry them out. Another way to think about them was just as a fixed point of some kind of, of adjustment process. And then there was cooperative game theory, and it didn't look at the detailed strategic moves that, that were made, because after all, we could make binding agreements. So it looked at models of what coalitions could do, and they were, they were the, the awkward phrase, solution concepts. There were multiple solution concepts floating around, but the one that I'm going to talk to you about today is the one called the core of the game. But cooperative game theory fell into disuse for some time because of what was sometimes called the Nash program, which said we could model all games strategically. That is, if, if you and I had a way of reaching binding agreements, maybe that involved writing contracts and exchanging them, and we could make those moves of the game. How would we reach agreements if we could? If, if, if we were going to describe all the moves of the game, maybe we could describe how we reached agreements in a strategic model. Uh, and, and that meant, of course, that as, as economists started more and more to focus on games that could be studied strategically, that we, we focused on games where the strategy sets were generated by small sets of actions, because if you were going to write down a game in enough detail to explain what everyone did, there couldn't be too many things that people could do. And related to the Nash program, though, was this idea of mechanism design, mostly associated with, with Hurwitz and, and Ryder, uh, which, which was that we could while we were thinking about designing games, we could design the games that people played with the hope of, of them having equilibria that produced outcomes that we liked. So let me tell you a little bit about the core of a game and ideas of, from cooperative game theory. And, uh, and, and one of the big ideas of cooperative game theory, which remember worked with coalitional models. So, so you're working with a model that says each coalition of players can achieve certain things for itself. And the core of the game will be a set of outcomes, a set of binding agreements, if you like, that have the property that no coalition could do better for itself by making different agreements. And this had some big successes. Uh, Oman's 1964 paper was, was a paper that, that helped crystallize the idea that, that a co the core was, was a model of perfect competition. In particular, he showed that in markets with a continuum of traders, the core outcomes were the competitive allocations. And of course, this is one of the areas where, where game theory and, and Ken Arrow's work were, were most closely related. And cooperative game theory and general equilibrium theory have a certain something in common, which is that they skip over all the details of the game, how prices are formed, and worry just about what are the outcomes that we should expect to happen. Okay, so, so that was a, a big contribution to that literature. Uh, the two that I'll talk more about were, were papers by Gale and Shapley and Shapley and Scarf, both of which not only considered games in which they could show that the core was not empty, but that, but that they, they could give us algorithms that would always 
produce outcomes in the core. And when I say always, I mean for whatever preferences the players might have. So these were algorithms that lent themselves to mechanism design. Uh, but, but mechanism design was, in a certain sense, part of the Nash program, and cooperative game theory fell out of fashion. And one indicator of that, I'm not, I'm not blaming them, I'm, I'm using them as an indicator, is that in the wonderful game theory text by Feudenberg and Tavol, there's no mention of the core, no mention of coalitional models, no mention of cooperative game theory. So that was a 1990 book, and, and at that moment in time, there was a lot of consensus among economists that we were gonna use strategic models to study everything that we wanted to study. And in that spirit was, was this idea of mechanism design. And, and again, the idea was that players have types, which, which maybe only they know, and we would like to, as a function of their types, get to some desired outcomes. And one way we can do that is we can create a game in which they'll have a message space, typically revealing their types. They'll report their types. And the equilibrium of this game will be for them to report their types and produce the desired outcomes. Okay, so you have to think about, can we create a game that gives them an incentive to correctly report their types? Or if it doesn't, nevertheless has an equilibrium that will give us the outcomes we desired if we knew their types. So that was the idea of mechanism design. And in market design, the part of market design, the big part of market design that comes closest to mechanism design is the design of auctions. Because the idea of, of mechanism design was you could create the game that players had to play in order to get the outcomes they were trying to get. And so if you're designing an auction, say, for the federal government to sell rights to offshore oil leases, you can design a set of rules that anyone who wants to buy at the, from the federal government must obey if they want to participate. That is, you say, here are the rules. The auction will be on such and such a day. And here is how you submit bids. And people who want to buy directly um, these rights from the government uh, have to follow those rules. So, so the mechanism designer the auction designer has a lot of power over the environment. But even for auctions, there are big strategy spaces. People can get their oil reserves not by buying licenses to drill, but by buying proven reserves from, from people who have won drilling rights in previous auctions. And uh, in spectrum auctions, sometimes bidders who might have been expected to bid against each other can merge beforehand so that, that they are cooperating with each other rather than competing with each other. So, so the idea of mechanism design, which is that you can create the game that people must play, even for auctions, where, where I think they're the part of market design that comes closest to the mechanism design idea, can sometimes fray around the edges in which players have larger strategy sets than the mechanism designer may have designed. So a lot of what I want to tell you about today is that market design isn't only mechanism design. Here's the, the market design diagram. But a better name for market design might sometimes be marketplace design. That is, we end up designing marketplaces which are small institutions in large environments. And in these large environments, people may have strategy sets that are bigger than the ones we designed for them about what messages they can send, what bids in an auction or, or what other information they can send. They might have strategy sets that extend beyond the marketplace. So there are things they can do before the market and after the market or instead of the market. And one of the things that market designers of, often have to do, therefore, is take account of these large strategy sets because in many cases, we're building marketplaces for markets that have already existed for a while. And people, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how medical students get jobs. Um, before a centralized clearinghouse was developed, they'd been getting jobs for a long time. And when, when the medical authorities decided to make a centralized clearinghouse, part of what they had to do to be successful was entice people to come to the marketplace. They couldn't make them come to the marketplace the way perhaps the Department of the Interior can make people come to, to bid on offshore oil leases. Okay, so the, the background to that design of medical clearinghouse, the first things to notice is it's a marketplace, a labor market with thousands of employers and tens of thousands of applicants. So lots of participants. And uh, right now, if, if you know someone who's graduating from medical school this year, their first job is going to be as a resident in a hospital, a kind of supervised pre-licensing position where they'll, they'll take care of patients under the supervision of a, uh, a more senior attending physician. And this, this market started in around 1900. And in 1900, uh, people 
got ready to graduate from medical school and applied for jobs and took jobs just around the time they graduated. But in the first half of the 20th century, the time at which they got jobs became earlier and earlier, and hospitals used lots of strategies to try to pin down promising candidates before their competitors. And so eventually, by 1945, the time at which doctors were being hired for their first jobs was two years before they graduated. So the summer after their second year was, was a time when lots of jobs were settled. And that caused lots of information to be lost. It was hard to tell who were, the, who were talented physicians of, of different sorts. And it was hard for second year medical students to tell what kind of physicians they wanted to be. You might have gotten an A in anatomy and you thought you wanted to be a surgeon and you got a surgical job in the summer after your second year, only to discover when you started going on rounds that you fainted at the sight of blood or something like that. So, so, so going so early lost valuable information. And uh, the medical authorities tried to change the, the market by enforcing times at which, before which offers couldn't be made, and that caused lots of problems too. There were exploding offers and there were verbal contracts made hurriedly and then broken. Uh, so the, the reason I'm telling you this is that over the course of the first half of the 20th century, lots of people were getting lots of jobs in medicine and they had big strategy sets through which they were getting them. And then an unusual thing happened in the early 1950s, which is a centralized clearinghouse was developed in the, in the medical profession, and something of that sort exists today. If you know someone graduating from medical school, then they won't uh, get lots of job offers. What they'll do is they'll submit to a centralized clearinghouse, a rank order after they've got on interviews, my first choice job, my second choice job, my third choice, and the residency programs will do the same thing. And then there's this process called the National Resident Matching Program that will mysteriously take those preference lists and turn them into a recommended match. But even the match is only recommended because in the 1970s we noticed, we started to notice that there were, uh, not everyone was taking the match that, that was proposed to them and the defections were particularly common among the increasing number of married couples and in the 1950s Virtually 100% of American medical graduates were men. By the 1970s, about 10% were women. Today, it's 50%. And medical students are very busy, but one thing they have time to do is to marry each other. And, and so there are many people coming on the market who need not one job, but two. And these people were, for whatever reason, not being well served by the market, and they could go elsewhere. So again, at another time, I might tell you more about couples. That's not my topic today. But, but my point is that even after the market was well established, people still had to be enticed to participate in it because they had big strategy sets and other things that they can do. And in the mid-1990s, this, this came to be a big problem and I was asked to, to direct a redesign of the match that took better care of couples and, and a number of other things. Uh, so, so that's sort of the, the, here's a schematic of the history I just told you about. But it's a schematic composed uh, not just from the medical market, but from many markets. So what I just told you about is there was a period in the first half of the 20th century where, where offers were getting earlier and dispersed in time and exploding offers and you would get an offer early in the summer after your second year, but you couldn't wait to, s it, you'd have to give an answer soon and you might not get another offer soon, so you, so you were faced with a difficult strategic decision. And later they tried to enforce uniform dates and later they got to a centralized clearinghouse and in the medical system, they have, they have stayed here, and I'm going to tell you a bit about that. But each of these arrows represents a transition that I've seen in some market. And so many centralized market clearing procedures failed and went back to unraveling going earlier and earlier. In particular, uh, quite a number of these were, were tried and failed in the uh, British National Health Service in the 1960s. So one question of market design was what makes centralized market clearing procedures work? And notice that design, when I speak of market design, design is a noun as well as a verb. Before you can do design as a verb, you need to understand what are the impacts of a market's design, design as, as a noun. And so one question is what was going on here? And let me propose a simple hypothesis to you. Let's say a matching is stable if there aren't a candidate and employer who are not matched to each other who would both prefer to be matched to each other. And the hypothesis will be the centralized market clearinghouses that work are the ones that produce stable matchings. And the theory is simple enough. Supposing it's not true that, that the matching is stable, that is, there exists a candidate and employer not matched to each other who would both prefer to be. Supposing I'm that candidate 
I match to my third choice hospital. But I know that sometimes the matching is unstable. I only have to make two telephone calls to find out if I'm part of a blocking pair. I, I call up my second choice hospital and I say, you know, I was just matched to a great hospital and I'm about to sign the contract they send me. But before I did, I thought I'd see if you have space for me because I'd rather work for you. And if they would rather hire me, they can say, absolutely, you know, we, we got an unexpected extra position, please come. And they can say to someone else, you know, we were supposed to send you a contract, but, but we can't because you know how deans are. They, they took away one of our positions um, <laughs> and, and we're not going to be able to. So, so that's the hypothesis. Centralized market clearinghouses work well when they're stable and not when they're not. And you can generate a data set. There aren't that many centralized clearinghouses, but, but loosely you can look at them and see whether they're stable, that's a yes or a no, and whether they succeeded or not. And there's, there's a definite correlation between the yeses and nos. It's not perfect, but as a result, you can also bring these into the laboratory and do laboratory experiments and turn on and off whether the market is stable. So let me tell you a little bit about stability because um, uh, the paper by Gale and Shapley, the 1962 paper by Gale and Shapley, produced, answered the question, must stable matchings exist? It's one thing for me to define a stable matching. It's another thing to show that they always exist and to suggest a mechanism by which we might achieve them. And, and this comes very close to the idea of a mechanism in mechanism design theory. What are the messages going to be? The messages are going to be rank order lists. Candidates will say, here's my first choice, my second choice, my third choice. And residency programs will say, here's my first choice, my second choice, my third choice. So those are the messages. And then the, the algorithm, the mechanism, is going to process those lists by uh, having every candidate apply to his or her first choice place. The places see how many positions they need to fill, order, order the applications they've got in order of their preference, reject all the ones who are in excess of the number of positions they have, but they don't accept the ones who they haven't rejected. They hold those till later. That's why this is a deferred acceptance algorithm. No acceptances are going to happen until it's over. And, and after rejections are issued, everyone who's rejected applies to their next choice on their preference list. Uh, the hospitals look at who's applied to them without prejudice about when they've applied. They order them in terms of their preferences. They keep the ones at the top. They reject the rest. But they don't accept these. And this continues until there are no more rejections. And at that point, deferred to the end of the algorithm, the hospitals accept the, the applications that they're still holding. Okay? So Gale and Shapley in 1960. Two, proved that a stable matching exists for every marriage market, and it's produced by the deferred acceptance algorithm. And it's easy to see the proof of that. Supposing I'm a student in this algorithm, so I've, I've proposed to my first choice, I've proposed to my second choice, eventually I'm matched to my third choice. How do I know there's no blocking pair? I would prefer to be matched to my second choice or my first choice than to my third choice. But I know they don't prefer me because I already applied to them and was rejected when they filled all their positions with people they like better than me. So, so this is a stable matching for any set of messages, for any set of preferences that could be submitted. So that's a theorem. And a second theorem says, how are we going to get those preferences? And, and the answer, of course, is we're going to have to ask people for their preferences. And when you ask people for their preferences, they're naturally going to ask you, what are you going to use those preferences for? And if you're not using them in a careful way, people might find that they will get things they prefer by not correctly revealing to you their preferences. But that's not a problem here. The deferred acceptance algorithm with students proposing makes it a dominant strategy for students to state their true preferences. So I'm not going to talk more about doctors today, but the reason I mention this is note that these are theorems from the two different kinds of game theory. One is a theorem from coalitional models. It says the core is not empty. And the other is a theorem from strategic models. It says the way you're going to play this game is you're going to submit a message which says, this is my first choice, this is my second choice, this is my third choice. And you are, of course, free to submit any message you want. It doesn't have to correspond to your actual first choice. But in fact, you would be well advised to state your true preferences because you can't do better than that. So there's an equilibrium of the game, a dominant strategy equilibrium of the game in which players state their true preferences. Okay, the students state their true preferences. So notice again, here's a theorem from what I, we historically called cooperative game theory, and here's a theorem from what we historically called strategic game theory, and they are not theorems about different games. It's not that one game has binding agreements and the other one doesn't. They are theorems about different parts of the same game. On the one hand, 
when we're going to ask you your preferences, it makes sense for you to tell them to us. And on the other hand, the matching is going to be stable, which means even though you have lots of strategies outside the marketplace, you can probably get a job other than through here, we're going to produce such a good matching of people to jobs that that won't be desirable. And I might, if I get my third choice, I might prefer to get my second choice or my first. And if they would also prefer me, we have big enough strategy sets that maybe we could have made an arrangement earlier or maybe we could have made an arrangement later. We might be able to find each other. The, the rules of this marketplace would be under attack. But if I want to go to my second choice but they don't want me, there's a good chance that I don't have a strategy set that's big enough to make them hire me even though they don't want to. So the stability is what entices people to come to the market and keeps them there and gets them to follow the rules of the marketplace, which is go exchange contracts with, with the market to which you were matched. Okay, so there's another way. So, so I've just talked about the fact that players have bigger strategy sets than, than in the marketplace that we design. We have to entice them to come to the marketplace and stability is a, is, is a way to do that. But there also can be other players, players who we didn't anticipate were gonna participate in our market and who may not want to participate but may have opinions about this market. And that's related to the fact that people may have strong opinions about this market who aren't planning to participate in it but might be able to interfere with the success of the market because markets need social support, okay? So, um, so we have to think about those. And in particular, for reasons I'll tell you because I've been spending a lot of time thinking about kidney transplants, I've been drawn to think about repugnant transactions and forbidden markets, okay? Markets that we don't like, we don't give social support to, and we might therefore try to ban, okay? So let's call a transaction repugnant if some people would like to engage in it and others think they shouldn't be allowed to. And of course, that still leaves open a lot of markets with negative externalities that we know all about. We don't think people should be able to pollute the air because that harms us. But let's, let's, so let's concentrate down not on those transactions that some people would like to do and other people think they shouldn't be allowed to, but on transactions that aren't easy, don't, don't e have easily measurable negative externalities to those who object. So in some, t some places where I've formulated this, I say, let's focus on those transactions that I might like to do, I might like to engage with someone who would like to engage with me, you think I shouldn't be allowed to, but you can't tell if I've engaged in the transaction unless I tell you. So that isn't to say it doesn't have negative externalities, but at least they're hard to measure or even notice. And of course, a, a, a typical, prototypical example might be same-sex marriage, right? Two people would like to marry each other, other people don't think they should be allowed to, uh, but you can't tell whether I'm married unless I tell you, one of the reasons people wear wedding rings is to tell you that they're married. Uh, so, of course, we all know the, the complex political history that, that we've gone through in the United States and in other parts of the world as the laws about same-sex marriage have changed. The, and it was a, a, you know, a bitter fight that continues about you know, whether bakers are obliged to sell wedding cakes to people who are having same-sex marriage. Let me show you another uh, place where there's differences of opinion about what's allowed, here's a, a slightly outdated, I made this slide last week, slightly outdated uh, <laughs> map of where marijuana is legal in the United States. And the green states, the light green states like California where I live, uh, and you know, look at that, uh, but not New York, right, uh, are, uh, uh, marijuana is legalized for recreational use. The darker green states are for uh, uh, medical marijuana, and the gray states are marijuana is largely illegal, with some variation. And as you know, the, oh, and, and Canada is green since, since mid-October, right? They have legalized recreational marijuana. As you know, uh, the, the recent incumbent U.S. Attorney General vowed to make America gray again. Uh, you know, he, he, he wanted all the, uh, he wanted marijuana to be illegal. It's a Schedule I federal drug, as, like heroin, as if it had, what Schedule I says is no accepted medical uses. So I, I imagine that eventually we're going to be all green, because that's something that, that can no doubt be fought in court. But, but post-election, uh, you know, Michigan, Michigan, Utah, and Missouri changed their color in a favorable direction, but, but North Dakota decided to to not, uh, just on Tuesday. So, so I anticipate that uh, 
that America will be green in this respect, partly because of the fact that marketplaces are small parts of a large environment. So supposing you're a state trooper in Idaho, which is surrounded pretty much, parts of Idaho at least, surrounded by places where marijuana is legal. There was a time where if you stopped someone on, on the highway and saw uh, marijuana paraphernalia in their car or you know, marijuana and you, were, you made an arrest, when you got back to the, the state police barracks, your colleagues patted you on the back and said, you know, you're a, a righteous state trooper, you made a good arrest. But now they're going to say to you, so you arrested someone who hadn't finished the brownies they bought in Seattle? Uh, you know, you're, you're certainly keeping us safe from crime, you know, as they, as they tried to go from one place to another where marijuana is legal. So, so the, the success of Idaho in keeping marijuana illegal is threatened by the fact that it's legal all around them. So another sense in which marketplaces are a small part of large markets. Now, one observation about repugnance is often there's some transaction X that isn't regarded as repugnant, but when you add money, it is, okay? So a, a famous one, of course, of great economic importance is charging interest on loans. For centuries, the church in Europe thought that it wasn't good to charge interest on loans, but of course, we would hardly have the global capitalist economy that we have today if we didn't have a, a market for capital. So banking is no longer repugnant, although with the exception of Islamic law, which finds interest uh, still to be repugnant, but, has, but there's a whole area of Islamic finance that has figured out ways, nevertheless, for people to buy houses when they're young. It turns out you can buy them with the bank and rent the house from the bank until you've bought the house, and that, has, that, that creates a security that's a lot like an interest-bearing security. So there's market design for all sorts of reasons. So another uh, repugnant transaction before I get to kidneys uh, and, and is surrogacy. You know, so I live in California where surrogacy is fully legal. You can, uh, you can contract with someone to, uh, with a woman to have a, a fertilized egg, an embryo uh, implanted by in vitro fertilization in her womb and she will bear the child for you and you can have your names as the mother and father on the California uh, birth certificate and you can pay her, right? The typical California surrogate is a married mother and is paid about $60,000. Here in the state of New York, surrogacy is legal, but paying the surrogate is not. Okay, that's also true in Canada. Okay, so there's not a lot of surrogacy in Canada. There's not exactly a lot of surrogacy in New York, although you can talk to surrogate brokers in New York who will introduce you to people from Pennsylvania. Um, so once again, it's difficult to prevent things that, that are, to, by making them illegal in your jurisdiction that are legal in neighboring jurisdictions. On the other side, think about guns. It's hard to enforce strict gun control laws in New York City when guns are widely available you know, elsewhere in the United States. Um, uh, but, th but this brings me, so, so incidentally, so in Canada, surrogacy is legal, but you can't pay the surrogate. In parts of Europe, surrogacy is illegal. In Germany and Spain, surrogacy is illegal. Right now there are 30 Spanish couples stranded in the Ukraine with their newborn babies waiting to find legal ways to repatriate the babies who, who aren't recognized by Spain. Italy seized a child and put him up for adoption uh, because they disapprove of surrogacy. And the European uh, Court of Human Rights uh, you know, affirmed their decision saying that states have a right to decide what constitute families, you know, who, who are the parents of children. So, so in Italy, it's not just that you can't pay the surrogate, you know, it's a crime. Okay, so I got into all this by thinking about kidneys. And as some of you know, and I'll, I'll tell you uh, a little bit about, I've been involved in trying to make kidney transplants more accessible. And one reason, what, one reason you need to make kidney transplants more accessible is, is kidney disease is a, is a big killer around the world. It's one of the top nine or 10 causes of death. There are 100,000 people in the United States this morning on the waiting list for deceased donor kidneys, kidneys from, from dead people, but we only managed to do 14,000 of those transplants last year. So the wait is long and dangerous. Thousands of people die while waiting, and being on dialysis is no picnic. So, so what people with kidney failure need is a kidney transplant, but you can't pay for a kidney. So here's a, a little section of the law that says it's un, 
the National Organ Transplant Act of, of the United States says it's unlawful for any person to knowingly uh, transfer any human organ for valuable consideration for use in human transplantation. So of course, economists aren't surprised that there are 100,000 people on a queue, because if we're not letting prices adjust, then, then supply doesn't adjust. But, but let me tell you what, what we do know. So uh, as I say, there are, are many more people waiting for deceased donor kidneys than, than we have them. But kidneys, oh, and the same is true in Europe. But kidneys are special because healthy people have two kidneys and can remain healthy with one. So if you are healthy enough and you loved someone who needed a kidney, you could save their life by giving them a kidney. You have to be healthy enough to be considered a, a, a plausible donor. Your kidneys have to function pretty well. But Sometimes, even though you're healthy enough to give a kidney, you can't give it to the person you love because kidneys have to be well matched. Not everyone can take everyone else's kidney. If I didn't know my blood type, the chance that one of you could take my kidney is somewhat over 50% if I were a random draw from the population. But the chance that my wife could take my kidney is only about 30% because my wife and I are parents and in the course of childbirth, her immune system might have become exposed to some of the proteins that our boys inherit from me, and she could have developed antibodies that would be prepared to attack those proteins should, should her immune system see them. So if she got my kidney, she might be prepared to attack it. So then I wouldn't be able to give her a kidney. And this is where exchange comes in and where economists come into the story. So here's a, a simple exchange between two pairs. Uh, donor one loves recipient one and would like to give her a kidney. Donor two loves recipient two and would like to give her a kidney. But, uh, but they have incompatible blood types. I'm not going to get into all the kinds of incompatibility. Uh, so before kidney exchange, we used to send these donors home. We'd say, I'm sorry, you would like to give to, to the person you love, but you can't. Go home. And your intended recipient will continue to wait on the deceased donor list, the long, dangerous wait. But what you can see is, of course, if we can arrange an exchange between these two pairs, then, um, then it's possible to get two transplants that we wouldn't otherwise have gotten. So that's the idea of kidney exchange. Uh, so let me tell you something about the prehistory of kidney exchange because it comes from that other, the last of the three papers I mentioned about the core. So here's a paper by Shapley and Scarf in 1974 in volume one, number one of the Journal of Mathematical Economics. So, so not a journal of applied theory. Uh, and, uh, and they said, let's think how agents could trade indivisible goods if they couldn't use money. And they called the goods houses. And, each agent has preferences over the houses, but trade is only feasible in houses. And it's a long story, but at the end of the paper they say, you know, after we explained this problem to David Gale, he proposed the following simple algorithm. Uh, he said, have, have someone point to their favorite house, and whoever they point to, have them point to their favorite house, and eventually someone must point to a house that's already been pointed to because there's only a finite number of houses, and that creates a cycle, and everyone in that cycle is pointing to their favorite house, have each of them take their favorite house and leave the market, and then start it again. Say to everyone, point to your favorite house among those that remain, and keep doing this until everyone has gotten a house. And what they observed is that, uh, is, is that that produces an outcome in the core. And the way to see that no coalition can do better than that is just to think how you would recruit a coalition that by trading among itself could do better than, than the process I just described. And you can see that you wouldn't be able to recruit anyone into the defecting coalition if they had left in the first cycle, because those people all got their very first choice house. So how about people who lived in the second cycle? They might prefer a house they didn't get. They might prefer a house that, that left in the first cycle. But you can't recruit any of the people in that cycle to join your coalition, so the second cycle can't form a coalition and so forth. So it's in the core. So once again, it suggests a mechanism. We could ask people their preferences and produce something in the core. But when you ask people their preferences, they have to have a reason to tell you the truth. Otherwise, if you can't find out what they want, you can't actually give them what they want. And it turns out that if the top trading proce procedure is used, it's a dominant strategy for every agent to state his true preferences. So, so once again, there's this idea that, that you, you have a theorem from non-cooperative game theory about dominant strategies and a theorem from cooperative game theory about the core. And, and, and these things work together to describe possibly a mechanism that we could build. And indeed, in my first paper with Typhoon Sunmez and Gordonver on kidney exchange, we, we proposed a mechanism that would use top trading cycles. Now, one problem with using top trading cycles is you might have some long cycles. 
it could take a long time before someone pointed to a house that's already been pointed to before. And this is a logistical problem. So this has to do with the strategy spaces that surgeons in, in 2000 uh, actually had. So here's a picture of one half of a simple two-pair kidney exchange. And it's in Cincinnati, Ohio. It's happening in 2006. I'm the man in the yellow gown, keeping my hands out of the way. Uh, there's, a, there's a kidney in this bucket. Right behind me, not in this picture, but off camera in this picture, steps behind me is another operating room where the nephrectomy was just performed. And the kidney is going into this gentleman. And at the same time, this is happening in Cincinnati, at the same time in Toledo, Ohio, not so far away, the other half of the transaction is going on. And when I say at the same time, I mean literally the same time. This gentleman named Steve Woodle got on his cell phone from the operating room and he called up Mike Reese in Toledo, Ohio, another surgeon, and said to him, we are ready in Cincinnati. We have successfully anesthetized the patients and made the initial incisions. If you are equally ready, we'll go ahead. And the reason they do this is because of the National Organ Transplant Act, which says you can't give valuable consideration for a kidney. It turns out we, we somewhat after this, we got an amendment to that which says kidney exchange doesn't constitute valuable consideration. But so kidney exchange turns out to be legal. That, that passed without dissent after three tries in the Congress. Uh, but, but you still can't give valuable consideration. The, the amendment says kidney exchange doesn't involve valuable consideration. But consideration is contract language. So you can't write a contract that says we'll give you a kidney today and you'll give us one tomorrow. And so if we did them non-simultaneously, there's the risk that on the first day one donor would successfully give a kidney to the patient of the other pair, and on the second day, the, the second part of the transaction would fail to go through. And in that case, the first pair would be really harmed because first, they would have had a surgery that didn't help them, and second, they wouldn't have a kidney anymore to offer in kidney exchange, so they wouldn't be able to participate in the next kidney exchange. So we always do these simultaneously, but you can see that it's hard to do lots of transplants this way because even the simplest pairwise exchange involves four operating rooms and four surgical teams that have to all be available simultaneously. So we needed to find a way to do more transplants, and, and we do those with, with non-simultaneous chains that are begun by non-directed donors. So we have two to 300 non-directed donors in the United States each year, people who would like to give someone a kidney and don't have a particular recipient in mind. And you can organize them in chains where the non-directed donor gives to the patient in a pair who then, that their donor moves the chain forward and so forth, so that each pair gets a kidney before they give one. Okay, so no, no pair is exposed to the danger that, that they give a kidney and, and don't get one. Now, the system is exposed to the danger that someone who, whose uh, mother got a kidney in September uh, might not be ready in February to, to pass it on. But in fact, we have less than a 2% incidence of broken chains. So people are, one way to think of this is people are nicer than economists sometimes give us credit for being. Uh, but, but also, let me mention that, you know, so of course in the New England Journal of Medicine, the patients are not identified. They're protected by HIPAA regulations. But in, they, they allow themselves to be identified in People magazine. And Helena <laughs> Helena McKinney, the last lady on this chain, is, is how it was published in the, in the New England Journal. She was blood type AB. This was a little bit of a mistake. We, it's, it's a little hard to find a good match for someone who's blood type AB. So today, we wouldn't ask her to wait a long time. We would ask her to give to someone on the deceased donor list. But that isn't what we did in the first chain. And three years later, uh, an appropriate match was found, and she was still game, and 12 more people were added to the picture. So we get a lot of transplants from these non-simultaneous chains. Uh, in 2012, the longest such chain had 60 people in the picture. Uh, there have been longer ones since. Most chains are shorter. The average chain has 10 people in the picture, five transplants and, and five nephrectomies. So, uh, so we get a lot of our living donor transplants through chains. Now, uh, the reason long chains are needed I'm going to speed up a little bit here. The reason long chains are needed is that, there are, is that the hospitals have large strategy sets. So when we started, right, that this is part of my theme of saying the marketplace is a small part of the big environment. When we started, um, if you wanted to do kidney exchange, you had to come deal with us, if you were a surgeon with patients. So we thought of the players as being the surgeons, 
their patients and their donors. But as kidney exchange became a standard form of transplantation in the United States, transplant centers started to play a role. And directors of transplant centers have bigger strategy sets than surgeons do. In particular, directors of transplant centers see many patient donor pairs and can decide if they wish to do the easy exchanges internally to their hospital and only send the hard exchanges to the interhospital um, uh, networks. And that's been what's happening. So here's a, a, a snapshot of data from one of the interhospital exchanges with which I work, the Alliance for Paired Donation, Mike Reese's organization. Uh, and everybody in this picture has blood type A, all the patients and all the donors. And the way the data are represented is each circle represents a pair, a patient donor pair, and an arrow goes from one pair to another if and only if the kidney from the donor in the first pair can go to the patient in the second pair. And what you see is there's only a small number of patient donor pairs who are easy to match, have a lot of incoming arrows, and the others are all hard to match because they have a lot of immune reactions. And so you can see how long chains form. And, and why short cycles play less and less of a role. Supposing everybody in this room represents a hard to match patient donor pair. So the chance that we can give any one of you a kidney is not so big because you're hard to match. But the chance in a big room like this that we can give someone a kidney is not so bad because there are many people in the room. The chance that you can give us back a kidney is very rare because we're hard to match. But the chance that you can pass it forward to someone else in the room is not so small. That's how long chains get formed. And they're formed because of the, the fact that big transplant centers have big strategy sets and don't have to show their easy to match pairs. So that's a, an ongoing problem in the design of these markets, how to, how to get to see all of those pairs. And some of it has to do with financial engineering. American hospitals have different costs for nephrectomies and that causes some frictions and we're trying to standardize that. Uh, so, so We've become a standard part of kidney exchange, depending how you, you of, of kidney transplantation, depending how you count the non-directed donors. We're doing between 10 and 15 percent of the living donor transplants in the United States through kidney exchange. So if I stopped here, I could have told you about you know victory after victory, but it's in a war that we're losing. When when I started working on kidney transplants, only 40,000 people were waiting for deceased donor transplants, and today there are 100,000. And some of that is good news. We're, we're able to keep people alive longer. And some of it is bad news. There's a diabetes epidemic. Uh, and there's a big, there, so there remains a big shortage of kidneys. And so, and this is not just true in the United States. It's true all over. So here's a, a picture of per million population deceased donor transplants and living donor transplants. And the wealthy part of the world is, is here. Spain and Portugal are, are very good at deceased donor transplants. The U.S. is pretty good at at living donor transplants. And there are parts of the world, though, where there are excellent hospitals, that is, there are many successful transplants, but, but a very small percentage of the population has access to them because in the Philippines, for example, the national health insurance does not cover transplantation. In fact, they only cover 40 days of dialysis. So that, that helps if you have acute kidney disease and, can, and your kidneys can recover with a little bit of dialysis, but kidney failure is a death sentence, a very prompt death sentence. Um, and again, kidney disease is in the top 10 causes of death in the world. So the question is, here we have all these highly sensitized pairs in the United States and in, in other wealthy countries that are now doing kidney exchange as well. And in places like the Philippines, there are excellent hospitals but no access to them for, for many uh, pairs. Can we make the kidney market thicker by inviting foreign pairs to participate in, in American kidney exchange? Thus increasing the number of donors and increasing the, the chance that, that exchanges can happen for, for people who are waiting a long time for exchanges in the United States. And so the first pair who, who we uh, tried this with are from the Philippines, uh, Jose and Christine, and here's the chain that they participated in. They re Jose received a kidney from an American non-directed donor who's blood type A. That turns out to make it a little hard to start a long chain, uh, but Christine, uh, Jose's wife is blood type O, and so a pretty long chain was developed in which tr 12 transplants were developed, were, were, were accomplished. And when you transplant an American, some part of the American healthcare system saves a lot of money because not only is transplantation a better treatment than dialysis, it's much cheaper. Dialysis is very expensive. So, so this generates a lot of savings in, at the very least, reduced time on dialysis for many Americans. And that s frees up enough money that uh, there's a, an escrow fund 
operated by the Alliance for Payer Donation, that Jose and Christine are able to access to pay for their medical care in, uh, in the Philippines. And in particular, they never touch the money. That, that's a little important in what follows. Uh, the, in the Philippines, you get your drugs from your, your doctor, not from a pharmacy in, in the case of transplantation. So their hospital can bill this escrow fund to, to take care of them. Uh, it's probably self-sustaining. I have students and colleagues who've worked on this. Uh, notice that, that, in a sense, this is a really special kind of opportunity. Normally, we can't offer transplantation, expensive medicine like that to foreign countries because they could do much more cost-effective things with an extra dollar than open a transplant center. But, but here's the case where, for free, we can invite people in because, because wealthy countries that have kidney exchange have pools of highly sensitized patients who have to wait a long time to find an exchange. And we can reduce that wait by, through mutually beneficial exchange with, say, the Philippines. But the medical logistics of this aren't the hard part. We've, we've done now enough of these to know that, that we can accomplish the medical logistics. But there are repugnance constraints. That's why I talked to you about surrogacy before and, and things like that. Uh, lots of people look at this and say, gee, you know, you're getting living donors from poor countries. Isn't that sort of organ trafficking? That is, maybe you're just buying kidneys from poor people in the Philippines, which is against the law. And, uh, and so we've gotten, we've gotten a great deal of support, but we've also gotten quite a bit of, of opposition of this sort. So in particular, we published a paper in the American Journal of Transplantation, uh, which published the paper, you know, they refereed it and published it, but in the same issue, they published an editorial that said, you know, maybe this is a dangerous idea that, that might be uncomfortably close to organ trafficking. And other people have said much more about that. Some of the objections we've gotten say, this is really an America first plan. Uh, the plan is not really about the international recipient nor about the international donor, but only about getting organs for US citizens, so it's exploitative. And other equally vigorous objections have said, it's not enough America first. You know, let's solve problems at home first. We should encourage programs that allow Americans to help Americans, which is certainly true also. Uh, so, so we're getting a surprising amount of pushback, which has led me to be more and more interested in understanding repugnance. The, the, here's a, a newspaper story in Spanish that says the Spanish National Transplant Organization has prevented the entrance into Europe of a new form of organ trafficking proposed by a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, so, so I, it, it, you know, it's personal. Uh, uh, so I'm interested. I'd like to understand this better. Now, so let me just assure you that we've gotten substantial support as well. The uh, American Society of Transplant Surgeons has supported us. Uh, the Italians have uh, supported us in the World Health Organization, although because of the opposition by the Spanish organization, it's unlikely that the WHO will take over this program and, and regulate it the way we think it should be. Uh, but, but I'm encouraged because we're getting support where it counts. So here's another lady who's allowed herself to be identified. She's Mexican, and she took part it's a long story, but she couldn't get a transplant in Mexico. They didn't have kidney exchange. She had to come to the U.S. where, where the, Mexican, the good Mexican health insurance wouldn't pay for a transplant in the U.S., so we had to, uh, we had to, to free up $70,000. And she got a transplant from a bridge donor, someone whose uh, daughter, whose son had gotten a kidney, but who was 67 years old, and for whatever reason, Surgeons are sometimes reluctant to take kidneys from people who are 67. I'm 66, so I can't imagine why that would be true. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, that kidney saved her life. This was in, uh, do I have a date here? Uh, this was in, in September 2016, so she's a, a healthy woman. I've, uh, you know, I've, I've seen her recently. Uh, and she, and this chain permitted two Americans to get off dialysis quickly instead of, uh, instead of remaining on dialysis. And in the Spanish press, they look at this and they say, they're exploiting this Mexican pair. But in the Mexican press, they say, they're saving the life of this Mexican pair. And so here's Newsweek on Espanol, which had a, as its cover story, transplants of kidneys between the United States and Mexico, a bridge of life. And a rough translation of the first paragraph says, 
Just as U.S. President Donald Trump is seeking to build a wall of thousands of miles on the border with Mexico, a tireless surgeon and an economist join forces to exchange organs between citizens of both countries. So I think that what is likely going to make this work is the fact that it's well received where it's important that it be well received. Uh, but, it's, but it's still a, a, a battle. And, and you know, I went and talked to the European regulators about this and fought our Spanish opponents to a draw. The, the European regulators didn't make a rule against it. So we, we believe that we're going to have a kidney exchange chain soon involving Italy. Uh, so let me, let me wrap up. Uh, marketplace design uh, is, is involved mechanisms that are embedded in large environments where there are other players and other strategies. And we find ourselves using the tools of both cooperative game theory and strategic game theory, non-cooperative game theory, at the same time to analyze the same systems d in different parts. So we're using non-cooperative game theory to analyze the mechanism itself. Will people tell us their true preferences when we ask them? Will they show us all their patients and donors? And we're using cooperative game theory to say, since players have strategies that, that don't involve using our marketplace, will it be enticing for them to use the marketplace? And will we therefore be able to get the benefits that we hope to get? So my last slide, let me, let me tell you about, I, I've, what I've been telling you about is how market design evolved from game theory. Let me think just a little more about the continuing evolution of market design. So when we began, we were mostly game theorists. And, you know, Perforce, we became engineers. You know, we had to figure out how to implement things. And now we're seeing modern empirical economists, this, this guy at the computer terminal. Uh, and uh, the kind of work I'm thinking of here, there's a blog post I made a while ago about a, a, a paper by, uh, by Prague Patak and Nikhil Agarwal and Atil Abdul Kodoroglu, where they, where they analyzed using uh, new econometric tools that they made the, the effect of the market we had designed, Parag was involved in its design when he was a graduate student, uh, for New York City high schools. So any of you who have a graduating eighth grader, complain to Parag. Um, and what they're doing is, is using the elements of the design to find where randomness allows them to identify what's happening. They, they can measure the effect that, that, that we've had. So it's natural that if market design is gonna become a uh, standard part of, of economics, which I hope it will become and remain, I think it's, it's doing that, that, that we're going to have to have not just game theorists and engineers, but real economists take part in it. And that's beginning to happen, which I'm very glad to see. Thank you. So great. It's my uh, happy task to be the uh, moderator for um, the next part, where we'll have some comments on um, uh, Al, Al's presentation. Um, I, I, I think it was just a, it was a tremendous uh, talk, and uh, it, it, it brings up something that uh, Al has, has, has written about uh, before, which is um, in the popular press, uh, economists often are seen as, as uh, being about um, uh, you know, forecasting markets and things like that. But really what uh, a lot of economics is really about is um, economists as engineers, uh, in Al's words. And um, you know you see this in in many areas, including you know, uh, auctions. Or Bill Vickery uh, at Columbia had won Nobel Prize for that, or what Joe has won a Nobel Prize um, for information and uh, corporate finance, trade, etc. And actually, his his uh, uh, talk um, uh, made me think a little bit about. Um, uh, a recent uh, uh, Columbia professor who won a Nobel Prize, um, uh, Robert Mundell, um, and uh, um, Mundell, uh, after he won, was invited on um, a, a comedy show, uh, the David Letterman show, and he had to uh, read off a list about the ta top ten uh, good things about winning a Nobel Prize, and I won't go through the whole list uh, here except to say one of the um, one of his uh, items in the top 10 is that you can win any argument by saying, if you're so smart, uh, how come you don't have a Nobel? Um, so there's actually a little bit of uh, mechanism design here in terms of our panel, uh, because our first um, uh, uh, discussant, uh, Parag Patak, 
uh, who is the um, uh, Jane Berkowitz Carlton and uh, Dennis William Carlton Professor of Microeconomics at MIT, uh, is a recent uh, recipient of the uh, John Bates Clark Medal, which is given to the best economist uh, under the age of 40 and is uh, considered a uh, very a strong predictor of someone who is likely to win a Nobel Prize. And of course, uh, we will then have um, uh, Joe Stiglitz, who has um, uh, already won a Nobel Prize. And one thing Joe doesn't realize is uh, I was in the department when Joe was, was hired, and uh, as our practice in the department is to um, uh, 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 is always do generate a reading report on whoever we're hired hiring, and I remember in Joe's case, uh, we looked at his CV, and at that point, um, it's early in his career, he only had 300 publications, and I remember some discussion of people saying, do we have to read it all? <laughs> um, and uh, I won't tell you what the answer was, but um, in any event, uh, with this, uh, we, we have a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist and uh, two discussants uh, who uh, have either won Nobel Prizes or are likely to win them. Um, I, th I think we can, we can we, we've designed a good mechanism in which uh, Al will have to respond uh, uh, directly. So without any further ado, I want to turn the floor over to uh, Parag and um, uh, who will make some, some comments. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, David, and uh, thanks for inviting me here. It's a, a, a real honor uh, to be here uh, discussing um, Al's Arrow Lecture. And um, the way I want to start the lecture actually is to uh, kind of salute Al uh, for the work on market design and kidney exchange. So um, I was very fortunate to be actually a graduate student when this work was just getting started. And I think this work embodies, uh, you know, some of the most exciting things going on in economics right now, a mixture of modeling, uh, empirical work, uh, policy work, and you know, uh, Al is now spending a lot of time on um, advocacy work, traveling and trying to make the case that economists actually have something useful and productive to, to offer. And so uh, the National Science Foundation uh, has a nice, uh, um, uh, you know, when they talk about why should the NSF support research in economics, uh, research on kidney exchange is kind of the poster child. Uh, so. Uh, that's really exciting, and uh, um, uh, it's actually something that I feel fortunate to uh, have been a student in one of the first ever courses in market design uh, way back in 2000, um, and that set me on my path. Um, so let me, let me begin my discussion actually by rereading Ken Arrow, and that's something that's often a good idea. Um, and I was looking back at some of Arrow's writings and trying to think about how to situate things he was interested in and the field of market design. And I stumbled upon this article that he wrote in 1969 uh, titled, The Organization of Economic Activities, Issues Pertinent to the Choice of Market Versus Non-Market Allocation. And you know, this is a, a kind of a summary of uh, Arrow's views of uh, the progress made in microeconomics uh, as of 1969. And in that article, he describes uh, you know, the problem of externalities. And he says, this is a special case of a more general phenomena, the failure of markets to exist. Uh, markets, uh, for many forms of risk bearing and for most future transactions, do not exist. Uh, and their absence is sure suggestive of, of inefficiency. So one way to think about what the field of market design is uh, trying to accomplish is to actually expand the role and definition of markets, uh, especially in domains where traditional instruments like prices uh, are prohibited? Can we use market institutions trading uh, when uh, you cannot buy and sell organs? And what's really nice about this article by Arrow is he continues to ask, uh, you know, why are there market failures? So, uh, you know, this uh, answer starts with the traditional reasons from undergraduate uh, microeconomics, informational asymmetries, market powers. And he goes on to conclude this article by offering kind of a different perspective on repugnant transactions. So he says, I want to conclude by calling attention to a less visible form of social action, norms of social behavior, including ethical and moral codes. I suggest one possible interpretation that they are reactions of society to compensate for market failures. Uh, these social conventions may be adaptive in their origins, uh, but they can become uh, retrogressive. And, uh, one way to interpret what Arrow is saying here is that um, 
rather than being a, a, um, an obstacle, uh, these repugnance constraints that prevent uh, certain types of transactions may actually reflect uh, market failure. So in the specific context of transacting kidneys, maybe opposition to transacting kidneys, uh, proxies for concerns about other types of market failures, like failures of enforcement, failures uh, having to do with informational asymmetries. Uh, are they really voluntarily transacting uh, your kidneys? Uh, and then concerns about distribution, such as unequal bargaining power. Um, so that's uh, Canero. And let me now uh, turn to the area uh, and the theme that uh, Al has developed, because it's a theme that I think applies not just to kidneys, but to, to many other places where market design has had made a lot of progress. That uh, the diagram that he showed in his lecture uh, uh, is taking kind of the economic model where we design a mechanism that's eliciting private information in order to achieve an outcome that has desirable properties. And one area where uh, Al did not talk but I think is quite important is the way that we measure whether an outcome is desirable. Um, so we often think, you know, uh, an outcome is desirable totally based on uh, the allocated properties uh, of, of the outcome. And uh, in the area that I've made a lot of, uh, you know, spent a lot of time thinking about in school assignment, uh, I think it's valuable to, not, to think not only of allocative issues, but also productive issues, okay, as the market actually leading to productivity improvements uh, in uh, the education sector. So uh, Al mentioned the core, this concept that, uh, uh, has uh, sometimes been forgotten in textbooks, but uh, I, I suspect the next generation of textbooks will uh, bring the core back to the fore. And you know, every year in New York City, uh, in part thanks to Al, you can blame Al as well, uh, core allocations are computed uh, for about uh, roughly 90,000 students. Um, and uh, you know, one view of this process is kind of in this New York Times article, the process it was an improvement over the previous uh, process and that's something that can be substantiated by looking at some data. Uh, so here is some uh, information about um, uh, what happened uh, in the new system in New York City. So this is uh, using data from 2003, 2004, so about 15 years ago relative to the old system. And uh, what you see is that uh, thanks to uh, an improved market clearing mechanism, um, the um, uh, core-based mechanism expanded the scope of the market in terms of how far kids are traveling to access schools. Uh, the difference uh, went up by about uh, 0.3 miles in travel distance. Now, that may not be a good thing, but if you put this together with the uh, information that participants reveal in the rankings of schools and ask, was it worth it to travel for farther schools, uh, you see pretty convincing evidence that the new mechanism gave more applicants uh, what they wanted. Okay, so in terms of allocated properties, uh, this system uh, is a uh, substantial improvement. So what you see in this figure is a, a, a computation of uh, overall student welfare from the old system and the new system. Uh, and the old system is in dotted uh, lines here, and there's actually two humps here. So the leftmost hump actually corresponds to the large share of students who were assigned uh, administratively or outside the process in the old mechanism. And so what the new core-based mechanism uh, succeeded in doing is dramatically reducing the number of children assigned administratively. Okay, so it's using the information from participants more efficiently, and uh, that's uh, why on allocative grounds the system uh, appears to have been an improvement. Um, and so when we think about this question about allocative issues versus things we may care about uh, beyond the allocation, the question of the larger game is very similar to the themes that Al has been bringing up. So uh, just as with kidneys, uh, market design for schools involves participants with large strategy sets. Even within the mechanism, there are questions about how choices are made uh, and whether or not uh, operators of systems like New York, and now there are about a dozen school districts that use systems based uh, on New York's, are they using the information uh, uh, to foster uh, uh, productivity improvements. So are schools being rewarded for performance or for value added? Another big uh, issue is wh what happens outside the mechanism. So uh, who is going to participate? Can we get uh, all of the different school sectors to participate? Um, and what happens to the uh, larger responses when we think about the game of 
where you're going to live. Are you going to now uh, decide to send your kid to public school because of an improved market clearing mechanism? Okay, and so what I want to explore in the next couple of minutes is this idea that the expansion of the market that's been facilitated through better market clearing mechanisms um, um, may not always be desirable, okay, unless it is uh, uh, accompanied with some compensatory policies, okay? So that uh, uh, article from the New York Times about game theory improving the New York City high school s system was followed about uh, two years later with another article condemning the system, okay? And so this is an article that uh, uh, is titled The Broken Promises of, of Choice in New York City Schools. The city's high school admissions process was supposed to give every student a real chance to attend a good school, but 14 years in, uh, it is not delivered, okay? And you know, what this article is reflecting is exactly the theme that Al brought up. So we have market clearing, but if the set of things that we're assigning is not changing, uh, we, we can't expect uh, you know, the rising tide to lift all, all boats in the Hudson here, okay? And, um, um, and so we can ask, well, what, what's the problem? Why, why hasn't that happened? Why hasn't the market worked as we might have thought it, it would work? Um, and let me turn to some um, numbers from another paper of ours, um, trying to understand some of the forces that happen when we elicit information on participants. So what we've done in this uh, paper is we've tried to characterize patterns of school demand. Okay, how does school demand uh, relate to distance? How does it relate to the levels of performance or the demographic attributes of kids at schools, and how does it relate to measures of a school's value added, okay? Uh, value added here is the average treatment effect. And um, the data is very rich, but if you look simply in terms of univariate comparison, schools that are uh, more oversubscribed tend to have higher achieving peers, okay? Uh, that's shown here in column one. In column two, you also see that schools that have higher average treatment effects, schools that are higher value added schools are also more oversubscribed. Um, but what happens when you put both of these in together? Okay, and uh, when you put both of these uh, uh, things in together in column three, you see that everything is loading on peer quality. So the idea of families being sophisticated consumers in the education market and being able to determine what school is gonna have the highest value add for them uh, uh, doesn't have much of a foundation here in New York City. Families are choosing schools based on peer characteristics, okay? And what's the, the, uh, the possible implication of that? So what we see is that parents have strong preferences for high-performing peers, uh, but they are not responsive to causal school quality as measured by value added once we control for peer, peer composition. So, you know, this pattern may be due to intrinsic preferences for peer attributes or uh, because uh, school composition serves as a signal of effectiveness. So uh, Miguel, who's here, has done uh, some very nice work on that. But either way, uh, what's the implication of this for the market's performance? If I'm a school leader and I'm going to be more oversubscribed if I have higher achieving peers, I should invest in getting higher achieving peers. So what we should do is uh, we should try to screen and select pupils. Uh, either in direct ways or indirect ways. And that's been a trend that we've seen in New York uh, in the you know, first uh, six or seven years after the system was put in place. So many schools initially started off as being pure random assignment. They moved to uh, adopting uh, open house uh, or other types of screening priorities. And indeed, the number of uh, high schools that have this kind of limited unscreened feature uh, has nearly doubled between 2005 and 2012. Now, aware of this, and this goes back to the theme that Al brought up of continual maintenance, the district of the, the Department of Education here in New York City has been actively trying to regulate schools to de-screen them, okay? And um, that's kind of their uh, uh, ongoing maintenance operation. And it raises the question of whether market design can improve school productivity without complementary efforts uh, to either improve decision making by parents or uh, efforts to actively de-screen schools so that we have an alignment uh, with demand and, uh, you know, efficiency and uh, productivity improvements. Let me tell you about one other example of, um, you know, the larger game uh, uh, in uh, Louisiana. So Louisiana is a very interesting setting for thinking about improved allocation systems because um, in uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they... Uh, established this program called the Louisiana Scholarship Program. Uh, the intention of this program uh, was to simply allow disadvantaged poor children 
uh, from low-performing public schools to attend private schools. Okay, so the idea here is there's a credit market friction. Let's let people uh, uh, get to go to private schools that they otherwise could not afford. Okay, and uh, the system used to allocate slots to these uh, private schools was actually based on computing core allocations again. And implicit in that system was actually some version of randomization. So if there's more applicants than seats, they would use a lottery to uh, determine who gets the seat. Um, and uh, this system uh, is one of the largest school voucher programs in the United States. Okay, so about 12,000 students applied for about 6,000 seats. Um, now to be eligible for this, you have to meet certain uh, income and um, uh, poverty thresholds, and you have to be coming from a school that is uh, a poor, poor performing school. On the school side, to participate in this program, um, you have to apply to the state government and say, well, um, uh, I want to admit some kids, um, and the state will uh, determine whether you're eligible to, to admit kids, okay? And so um, you can think of this as an expansion of the market. Uh, it's a setting where um, uh, families have additional choices, and participation here is totally voluntary, okay? And so we have a study of this program, and in the study, uh, we take advantage of the fact that some of these schools are oversubscribed, so people wanted these uh, programs, and therefore there's a lottery. So we have a very sharp treatment control contrast between those who won the lottery and those who lost the lottery. And uh, what we found is uh, actually the uh, um, students who won the lottery, what are, are labeled here as treated compliers, the blue line, uh, actually experienced a substantial reduction in achievement relative to the students who lost the lottery. Okay, that's the red line here. For mathematics, this is about 0.4 of a standard deviation. For English, uh, it's about uh, 0.15 of a standard deviation. And, um, you know, benchmarking this, how large are these impacts? So, Marty West, a, a colleague at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, I think put this quite nicely. He said, the negative effects in Louisiana are as large as, as any I've seen in the literature, not just compared with other voucher studies, but in the history of American education research. <laughs> and so this was an expansion of the market, but there was no guide rail. There was no safety uh, uh, here. There's no safety lever here, because the way the market was set up was the state said, any private school who wants to participate, file an application, and we'll let you participate. So if the government is coming in and saying, we will pay for kids to go to your school, what you tend to see is the schools that are struggling the most are those that opted in to participate. Okay, and so, uh, you know, these results do not imply by any means that all choice programs or all voucher programs are bad, but they do cast doubt on the potential benefits of the expansion of the market without adequate safeguards, okay? And so, uh, in this specific context, uh, uh, stronger school-side regulations and, and sanctions, and in the New York City context, um, um, better decision-making aids, okay? And so let me uh, wrap up with this kind of last theme. Again, you know, very much echoing uh, a lot of the things that Al said, but for the context of school assignment. You know, when we think about the larger gain, it highlights the importance of monitoring and continual maintenance, okay? Uh, and it's kind of a theme that we see over and over in uh, uh, market design in education. Uh, so I, I have two examples here. So we have some work uh, looking at the expansion of uh, school access to high-performing Chicago schools through very creative affirmative action policies. Uh, and what we find there is an unintended consequence, actually, that expansion of access actually reduced achievement for the intended beneficiaries, okay? Uh, another kind of uh, 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 finding that we have now, this is more of a model. Uh, if you think about expansion of choice in the presence, presence of uh, residential sorting or housing markets, uh, the larger game, as Alice described, uh, you can find examples where market-based reforms can actually improve school quality for the most disadvantaged, but still reduce their overall welfare by pricing them out uh, uh, um, when school quality increases. So um, I think this is kind of an exciting time to be doing market design because we're starting to learn that the world is much more complicated than that um, diagram that Al started with. And, uh, moreover, uh, you know, these improved market clearing schemes may only be a small part of the, the overall picture. Okay. So, so uh, let, me, uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Al and Parag uh, for coming here. Uh, uh, Al for giving the uh, 11th annual uh, Kenneth Arrow Lecture. Uh, before turning to my comments on his presentation, let me just make a 
few remarks about the lecture series uh, and about Ken Arrow, uh, whom it honors. Uh, the series uh, began uh, in 2008, as it was said, this is the 11th uh, 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 lecture. Um, to honor, I think, uh, Columbia's most distinguished uh, graduate in, in, in e PhD in economics. Uh, I, I, you're an undergraduate, so <laughs> you, you, that, we're, not, we're not making any direct uh, yeah. comparisons. Want to make, and, make and being clear. compared to Beverly okay. Ken is not a big insult. I tell our students that uh, he sets the standard for a PhD to which they all uh, should aspire. Uh, in other words, uh, that really is the minimal level of a PhD. Uh, his, his PhD, <laughs> for those of you who know, was uh, 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 social choice and individual values. And uh, it created an entirely new field, the theory of social choice. Um, and the main result of uh, that thesis, uh, now referred to as the arrow and possibility theorem, uh, is of such greater, great generality that it uh, actually was mind-blowing. I mean, I'm sure all of us, uh, when you first read it, uh, um, and, and it remains that way today. It asserted that there was no social choice mechanism representing the arbitrary preferences uh, of a collection of individuals satisfying some elementary and seemingly obvious conditions such as transitivity and the relevance of irrelevant alternatives other than having the choices reflected uh, reflect that of a single individual, the dictator. Uh, so it, in other words, it, it, uh, before that, economists uh, knew from Condorcet that there were problems with majority voting. You could get cyclical voting. A is preferred to B, B is preferred to C, and C is preferred to A. And so you'd, the majority voting didn't seem to give uh, a good answer. but. Um, it always left open the question, well, maybe there was some other way of voting, you know. Uh, uh, and what he said is, there is no way of voting. I mean, just conceptualizing that question, you know, all possible ways, there was no way you could do it, except uh, a dictator. And uh, that's why America now is trying to solve that problem. <laughs> 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 because, you know, democracy doesn't work, so let's try, let's try something else. No, that's not what's going on. Um, um, so um, uh, we honored uh, Ken uh, with a lecture series um, in which each lecturer would take some work of Ken and write a piece that extended extended it or, or is inspired uh, by it. Uh, one of the reasons why we were happy to do this uh, was not only the, the uh, King's greatness, but given the breadth of uh, King's contribution, uh, it meant that there was little constraint on uh, whom we could invite with contributions to uh, general theory, uh, general equilibrium theory, social choice, uh, imperfect information in healthcare, imperfect risk markets, um, uh, air to group security markets, uh, learning by doing, uh, economics of education, climate. Um, and you can see the whole series uh, of books out there. And just to uh, encourage you, put pressure on you, uh, <laughs> you you're supposed to produce, uh, convert this into a, a lecture, and it'll be a beautiful book when you're finished uh, doing it. Um, I think it really will make a, a, a real contribution. Uh, and it's not just flattery. Uh, um, <laughs> But one of the, the high points uh, until uh, two years ago was every year uh, uh, the author of the lecture would be joined by Ken and one or two other discussants. And Ken's reflections, sometimes touching on how he came to write the paper, always on the relations between the insights of the paper and his original work, uh, were a high point uh, of the event. Uh, last year's event was the first uh, since his passing with Glenn Lowry's uh, masterful presentation on the economics of discrimination. Uh, the lectures uh, reflected that uh, the fact that Ken was not only one of the deepest thinkers of his time, he was also uh, one of the best applied theorists, uh, and that he cared deeply about the society in which he lived. Uh, and uh, that's another reason why I, I, I both your presentations were so appropriate for uh, Ken's, for honoring Ken. Uh, um, 
one of the uh, uh, very uh, telling stories uh, from last year was uh, that of uh, Manny Yari, who uh, told the story when he came the uh, uh, first day he came to graduate student at uh, Stanford. Uh, he, uh, Ken was very open and he had a, 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 a long discussion, first year graduate student. And then that evening he went into uh, uh, San Francisco and as he was going in, he saw uh, uh, a protest uh, around, uh, uh, I think it was Woolworths. And he glanced and he saw Ken Arrow. <laughs> and uh, he stopped and uh, was a little surprised to see Ken Arrow, the protest about Woolworths discrimination, uh, segregation in the South. So it wasn't only that Ken was writing articles about discrimination, he was uh, actively uh, involved. And uh, he, he went over and talked to Manny, he was worried something was wrong with Manny. Uh, Manny was worried something what, what was going on. He hadn't participated in, in a modern American life. At the, that time, we had a lot of protests, and uh, we're back uh, 50 years later in another time where we're hopefully we'll continue to have a lot of protests. Um, but uh, he was, uh, uh, Ken was engaged, active engaged in, in our society uh, in the way that, that Al has been in trying to solve a, a very particular uh, important problem that affects the lives of uh, large numbers uh, of people. Uh, what the one paper that I uh, wrote with uh, Ken uh, was on another area that he cared uh, passionately about, which was climate change. Um, you know, uh, uh, I was one of the lead authors of the uh, 1995 IPCC uh, Intergovernment Panel of Climate Change, and um, one of the big issues there uh, is uh, discounting. Uh, how do you treat uh, the uh, future consequences of uh, climate change, of global warming? and um, the, the, the paper uh, that we wrote together uh, argued that uh, in the presence of uh, uncertainty, uh, that it changes the discount rate and that we had argued in the absence of that there should be a very low discount rate, but with the presence of uncertainty, it could actually be zero or negative. And I, I have a little bit of a digression, but I hope you don't mind, uh, because one of the uh, one of the things that uh, I'm engaged in uh, right now uh, uh, is a suit against the Trump administration um, over uh, on, on behalf of 21 uh, children, uh, one of whom is a Columbia uh, student, who each of whom is uh, having their lives uh, individually ruined in one way or another. Uh, by climate change. One is living on an island off the coast of uh, Florida and it will be underwater and it's being already uh, polluted. Another one, our Columbia student, uh, lives in a, a farm in southern Oregon and the farm, uh, climate change is, is destroying the farm, uh, let alone being uh, uh, affected by uh, uh, the wild, threatened by the wildfires. So, um, uh, uh, Two weeks ago, the, uh, uh, so uh, this is suit's been going on uh, saying that, that uh, what the, the government is uh, systematically uh, not giving due weight to uh, the well-being of these children going forward. And uh, that, uh, Discounting is relevant because the way the U.S. the Trump administration discounts at seven percent, uh, and that says anything that happens 50 years from now is worth almost nothing, and two generations is really worth nothing, and so that what they're doing is systematically um, uh, uh, not paying attention to future generations. So it's an important issue, and it's the kind of issue that that can. Uh, would uh, felt very strongly and, and it was easy to get him uh, engaged. Just to finish that little story, uh, two weeks ago, uh, 
the Supreme Court stayed our trial. And uh, on Friday, they uh, said we're going to go ahead and trial. So in two weeks, uh, these children will have their day in court in Oregon and uh, before the district court. And I feel very confident, uh, given what the judge has already said, that uh, we will prevail. Uh, the children will prevail. I'm an expert witness in, in that. And uh, the, uh, the appellate court in San Francisco has also been favorable. And uh, hopefully, by the time it gets uh, through the Supreme Court, we'll have a new uh, president <laughs> <laughs> who will accept the findings of this court and say that uh, in the future, you have to pay uh, attention to, uh, to future generations. But I, I, I mention uh, these issues because uh, Ken was so intimately, you know, he, as an applied economist and a committed economist, he believed that economics could make a difference for the lives of people. And he was really actively involved. And, and I just want to uh, uh, say that Al is keeping up that kind of tradition and it, it's something uh, that uh, is really important. Uh, let me just talk a minute, it's hard not to, about my, my own uh, connection with Ken. Uh, I had the benefit of being a student of Ken <coughs> when he came to teach at MIT. Um, we then took sabbaticals uh, the same year in Cambridge and I eventually joined him at Stanford. At first at the annual su summer workshop at IMSSS, thanks to for mathematics and social science, and then as a member of the faculty. Uh, and um, one of, I, I want to just say a little bit about uh, that kind of personal uh, interaction. Um, we were in a regular uh, play group, uh, reading group together. Uh, we got together and read plays once every three weeks, four weeks. Uh, and what he brought to everything he did, that same kind of uh, 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 meant a genius almost. Uh, he could remember every play, uh, who played the, uh, and, and, and insight uh, in the humanities that he, he brought into his uh, mathematical uh, work. But I really want to uh, mention that um, what was distinctive uh, about him, one, uh, after he did the, uh, uh, his, his PhD thesis, he went on to prove the existence of competitive equilibrium and the fundamental theorem of welfare economics, the first and second fundamental theorem of welfare economics, which said every competitive equilibrium is efficient and every efficient outcome can be maintained through a price mechanism. Um, in some ways, you would have said, uh, and for a lot of people, that would have been enough. I mean, he'd done a fantastic thesis, and then uh, this theorem that answered a question that people had talked about for 175 years. I mean, Adam Smith's invisible hand, that the pursuit of self-interest would lead to the well-being of society. Uh, I would call it a conjecture, it wasn't a theorem, until Ken proved it uh, with, with uh, Gerard de Brew. But what was remarkable is, as he proved it, he realized that there were conditions that had to be satisfied. Now, the difference is, if he had been at the University of Chicago, he would have said, ah, that proves the markets are efficient. But that wasn't the nature of Ken. What he said is those conditions are never going to be satisfied. You know, he went and testified in Congress in the way and said those conditions are not conditions that we see in our world. And then he spent the rest of his life trying to understand how markets actually worked. So he took what I also took his work to mean the proof of the fundamental theorem of welfare economics was the beginning of the economics, not the end. And it was the beginning of the inquiry into uh, how do we make uh, mark uh, the economies work better. And that really then fits in with, with the work uh, that Al and, and Parag have been engaged in, it, which is markets, uh, as they've evolved, often don't sa solve well, important allocation problems. And uh, that means that there are real uh, opportunities for thinking about how to improve them. And the particular approach uh, that 
uh, Al and Parag have taken have, have been to try, uh, is this area of market design, of ways of organizing particular markets. And what is particularly, uh, I think, uh, impressive about uh, the talk that you've just heard was the recognition that uh, you could never really create a, a market uh, in isolation, that every market is part of a broader uh, context. Um, there were a, a, a few quotations I have from, uh, from the paper that uh, he, he sent us that he's writing. Um, uh, but let me just mention, uh, um, uh, the big lesson of market design is that marketplaces are small institutions in a big economic environment. Participants have bigger strategy sets than you can see, and there are lots of players, not all of whom are participants in the marketplace. So we needed a way to design mechanisms that have both good equilibrium properties for the rules we knew about and good stability properties for the strategies we didn't know about. So it was really in, in that same sort of broad way that, that Ken thought of the world. How do you see this whole system? And uh, while focusing on a one little, one, one little part, seeing that within uh, the broader uh, uh, context. Now, my own work has not been uh, uh, involved in that kind of market design or mechanism design, but it's been really more in the context of actual markets, uh, like financial markets, uh, that exist already. And um, the lessons that we, we learn from that are really very parallel. So one of the, the things that game theory is uh, uh, so uh, good about is you have to write down the rules of the game very explicitly. And that makes you very aware that the rules of the game matter a great deal. But when we teach competitive equilibrium analysis, or uh, we don't talk about the rules of the game. They're sort of in the background, as if it's obvious what the rules of the game are. But if you go to any market that you really know about, like the financial market, uh, or even the futures markets, you know, whatever, there are a lots of rules of the game. And the players play with uh, norms, expectations. They decide whether they play or they don't. And the big issue facing society is how do we structure those games? What are the rules that we place on the games that affect how people play? And let me just mention one that, that really has a little bit of, of uh, uh, parallel to the, maybe you might say, the frustrations that uh, Parag described in some of trying to create better markets and uh, getting perverse. One of the things that um, in the reforms of the financial market after uh, the debacle of uh, 2008 was using central clearing uh, houses. Now, for an economist, the idea central clearing houses, more transparency, uh, you don't have to worry about counterparty risk, uh, you, you've, you've solved limited liability problems, uh, you have more competition, thicker markets, you know, you sit there and you say, you know, this is obvious that this is the right way to do things. And uh, it is the right way to do things. But uh, a very large percentage of the market did not want to do it that way. And in the end, uh, what happened was we only got central clear, uh, market clearing for a fraction of the trading and derivatives and CDSs. And uh, there was an obvious reason for that, that many of the players in the markets don't like transparency and don't like competition. And they had to be made to, to, to go into the market, but part of the broader game is a political game 
and they were paying, bribing our, our uh, uh, particularly uh, Republican congressmen, more for making sure that they uh, did not be, weren't pushed to go into the central clearinghouse uh, in a central market because, you know, the basic thing that we teach our, our students is competitive marketplaces have zero profits. And there is no fun in having zero profits. <laughs> and uh, so, so, and they understood this. You know, they went to our business school where we teach them uh, about uh, uh, creating market barriers and perfections of competition, all the things that you do to make sustainable profits. And they knew that this was designed to get rid of their profits. So of course they were willing to spend literally hundreds of millions of dollars to make sure that they, these rules were not imposed uh, on them. Well, um, maybe I, I should just, uh, uh, there are a couple more points I want to make just uh, 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 very briefly. Uh, um, I think the uh, point that uh, Al brought up about uh, repugnance uh, is really important. Um, and it actually uh, matches a broader set of discussion that go, is going on in other arenas. Um, uh, Michael Sandel, Sandel has written uh, a, a very influential book uh, about what are um, uh, activities that are, uh, should be subject to the marketplace. You know, you can't sell yourself into slavery. Um, they're, they're, and the question is, uh, for e many economists, the question is, why can't you engage in certain kinds of market transactions when it's Pareto superior? Both sides want, want, agree to do it. It's a voluntary exchange. Indentured servitude, voluntary exchange. Why don't you, but slavery was not a voluntary exchange, so let me make that clear. <laughs> but people used to sell themselves into indentured servitude for seven years, and we don't allow that anymore. So there are a whole category of exchanges. You can't buy votes directly, but you can buy them indirectly. Uh, you know, so, so there are all kinds of restraints on what are acceptable activities. And uh, the, the realization that that plays an important role in how we shape markets and think about markets is, is, is very important. Now there are uh, two comments on that. One of them is uh, these can change over time and we don't really understand where the, a lot about where they come from. And, and, and the discussion uh, that Al brought out that similarly uh, societies that look relatively similar have very different attitudes about what are acceptable or not. So that, that itself suggests that there's a really important uh, research issue of what determines uh, this notion uh, of repugnance. But one aspect of it is was what Parag uh, brought out, that a lot of our notions of what is repugnant are related to deep inequalities in our society and inequalities of power that uh, if everybody were equal and somebody said, uh, I needed a, a kidney and I have two kidneys, I might not be willing just to uh, give you one, a kidney, but if you gave me a little bit of money, I would feel good about giving you a kidney and I would feel good about having a lot of money. And it would be, it, it would be clearly a Pareto superior. I don't think we feel, bad about it. You know, I think we could accept that kind of exchange, but the reason we don't is that we know that a very large fraction of the people who might wind up in this are people who are selling their kidney because it's the only way that they can stay alive or the only way that they can keep their mother from buying medicine for their, for their mother or for their child. And so, it, it is very curious that we have this deeply ingrained inequality in our society, and we know some of the consequences of it, and they are so ugly that we don't want to face 
the consequences that somebody would be willing to sell their kidney. And so we would rather have the person's child die than face up to the ugliness of the world that, that we've created. Um, and that I think is, we ought to be thinking about that uh, a little bit more about why we find uh, some of these um, uh, transactions uh, so, so repugnant. And the final thing uh, I want to remark is that when we talk about uh, the game, the, the, the uh, uh, environment in which uh, the market takes place, um, in the background, uh, uh, Alice mentioned this uh, in some of his other work, uh, are things like norms that, uh, um, and again, one of the issues is we don't always know where our norms come from and uh, whether, uh, how deep those norms are and, and, uh, and how stable those norms are. Um, and that is an issue, uh, you know, uh, that our president has raised very, very uh, forcefully uh, because norms that were very strongly held are violated every day. And so even when you have a norm that is very widely held, it may be precarious. And then we have a difficult question emphasis as a society. Do we leave norms as just unstated rules of behavior that we understand? Or do we really need to inquire more deeply about what are our norms and embed them in law, embed them in laws and regulation? Because if we live in a world in which seemingly with impunity people can break the norms, then our system can't function. And so I think uh, what we're going through is actually raising some very deep questions about uh, how markets and marketplaces can work and how, how explicit we have to be in writing out uh, all the, the rules and regulations that are behind uh, what makes our system, uh, you know, whatever market we're in, uh, small or big, uh, work. And finally, I, I wanted just to say uh, uh, one of the things I really appreciated about your talk was the way you brought together uh, two things that I had never seen so clearly, cooperative and non-cooperative game. I think it really gave a lot of insight into this whole area of game theory and how it relates to markets uh, more broadly. So thank you for that, too. Well, um, so, so I just uh, I just glanced at my watch and I realized that we have minus twenty five minutes oh. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, for for the remainders. But I just want to give uh, Al just a few moments to minutes um, to respond, and then um, uh, we, we will we will end the, 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 the session. Okay. Well, let me just say that I agree with lots of, of uh, commentary. Uh, you know, Joe just called for further. Uh, attempts to understand repugnance and which markets we support and which we don't. And I agree that that's something that's a really important subject, much too important to be left just to the philosophers, that we economists need to better, <laughs> better understand uh, repugnance and which markets get support and which don't. I've, I'm spending a lot of my time uh, trying to do that. Let me, let me tell you just briefly something that was in my extra slides but, but didn't have time for. Uh, so, I, so I'm in the process of conducting with, with my colleague Stephanie Wong um, some representative sample surveys about social attitudes towards um, kidney exchange, surrogacy, and prostitution in the United States, Spain, and Germany. And one reason we pick those three repugnant sometimes markets it, and those three countries is that the laws regarding those things are different in each place. So in California, where I live, surrogacy and kidney exchange are fully legal, uh, but prostitution is illegal. In Germany, it's just the opposite. Prostitution is legal, but surrogacy and kidney exchange are illegal. But what we find when we conduct a survey is that the attitudes of a representative sample populations are much more similar. They're not, they don't reflect the laws. The laws don't reflect strong intuitions by the population. But rather, it seems these laws, especially you think about laws like surrogacy, which are very different in different places, seem to have uh, 
grown up very differently from, from in the case of surrogacy, different uh, customs and rules about child custody, for example. So when you think about surrogacy, well, so prostitution is, is an ancient repugnant market, um, but surrogacy is not in vitro fertilization was invented in the 1970s, and there were no laws about it. So uh, surrogacy started to happen, and eventually custody battles started to sometimes happen, and judges were faced with custody decisions for, for taking care of children, which is you know, a, a big right and purpose of the state. Um, and they called for legislation, and they got different legislation in different places for for what I think of as largely idiosyncratic reasons, because it turns out they don't reflect different deep intuitions among the populations. So, so it's going to be a little hard to understand repugnance because it because things that are legal and unrepugnant in one place may be illegal in another, and and uh, you know may sometimes be repugnant. Let me just leave you with a thought: it's illegal in California to eat horse meat uh, because. We had a referendum in 1998 in which as many people voted to make it a felony as voted for Gray Davis as governor. So, uh, so, uh, so, so. On, on the other hand, it's going to be hard for you to find horse meat in New York because while Congress has never succeeded in passing a law against it, they have removed the authority of the Department of Agriculture to inspect horse meat. So there's no USDA grade A horse meat. <laughs> uh, well, on that note, um, I want to thank uh, Al and our two uh, uh, commentators uh, for really inspiring and interesting uh, discussion. Thank you very much.